affects all of us. It affects our economic health more broadly. So the CFPB would be given the capacity to tackle these abusive and deceptive practices and then be on the lookout for the next breed of financial scams. Madam President, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent for an additional 30 seconds. Is there objection? Without objection. For these reasons, Madam President, uh, it's my hope that the Senate will take action quickly to confirm uh, Mr. Cordray's nomination and then put in place an effective consumer financial watchdog to ensure Americans get the tools they need to take control of their own financial destinies. It'll help our economy. It'll help Americans. It'll help small businesses. This is the right thing to do. Let's confirm this gentleman to head the CFPB. Madam President, uh, thank you for your attention. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Kansas. Madam President, uh, thank you. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, in November, uh, in communities across our country, our nation's men and women in uniform were honored on Veterans Day for their service to our nation. I'd like to share a story with my colleagues of one exceptional Kansas veteran who is no longer with us, but whose story stands as a lasting tribute to the members of our armed forces, whose courage and sacrifice preserves our freedoms. Father Emil Capon was born in Pilsen, Kansas in 1916 and served as a Catholic priest in the Diocese of Wichita for four years before volunteering for the U.S. Army in 1944. During the Korean War, he served as a chaplain for the 8th Cavalry Regiment of the 1st Army Division. His courageous actions in the Korean battlefield saved countless lives as he ran under enemy fire to rescue wounded soldiers. When Father Capon was taken prisoner in 1950, he continued to live out the Army chaplain motto, for God and country. In the bitter cold of winter, Father Capon carried his injured comrades on his back during forced marches through snow and ice, gave away his meager food rations, and cared for the sick who were suffering alongside him in the prison camp. When all looked hopeless, this simple priest from Kansas rallied his comrades, regardless of their faith, to to persevere until his own death as a prisoner of war in 1951. This good man distinguished himself by laying down his life for the sake of others. Earlier this year, Senator Roberts and I introduced legislation to award this Kansas war hero the Medal of Honor for his actions of valor in the Korean War. The legislation would request and provide the Department of Defense and the President with the authority to grant this important honor. By waiving the three-year statute of, of limitations, the time frame in which it can be awarded, Father Capon would be eligible to receive the Medal of Honor. Senator Roberts and I offered this legislation recently as an amendment to the Senate Defense Authorization Bill, and the amendment was unanimously approved by this Senate. And I thank Senators Levin and McCain for their support. My Kansas colleagues in the House were also successful, including this language in the House's version of the National Defense Authorization Act. And I would ask that with such strong support from both chambers, this provision be included in this year's final defense authorization bill. Father Capon is most deserving of the distinguished award, and I am hopeful the Secretary of Defense and President Obama will use the authority outlined in this legislation to give Father Capon his long overdue recognition. At this special season of the year, we are reminded that there are saints and heroes throughout the history of our nation that put others above themselves and live by God's plan for their lives. May we be inspired by their example and live our lives accordingly. Father Capon demonstrated that one person can make a difference and help change the world. I yield the floor. Senator from Tennessee. Thanks, Madam President. Um, Madam President, I want to speak this afternoon of a lesson for Washington, D.C. from Maryville, Tennessee, which is my hometown. And the lesson is a lesson most of us learned in kindergarten, in which I learned in my mother's kindergarten, which was in a converted garage in our backyard, Maryville, and it was three words, work well together. Uh, the latest example of that out of my hometown was all over the sports pages on Sunday, historic championship. Maryville wins the 13th state title most ever. Our football team has learned to work well together. They won their second consecutive state championship, 13, as the newspaper said, in all. They beat Memphis Whitehaven. I watched the game on statewide 
tele television. Their record this year was 15 to 0. It was their ninth state title and ninth perfect season under an extraordinary coach, George Quarles, who has won 179 games and lost 13 games in his career of coaching. This is the most state titles of any, any school in Tennessee in its history. Uh, the team scored 35 or more points in 109 of Coach Quarles' first 191 games. It's averaged 30 or more points in 12 of his 13 seasons. And his senior quarterback this year, Pat Robinson, who's got scholarships from good schools everywhere, was named the Gator Aid Tennessee Football Player of the Year, part of which has to do with his academic credentials. Uh, he's got a straight A plus average. Which leads me to the second thing they work well together on in Maryville, Tennessee, and that is that the Maryville City Schools were named the best overall school district in the state based on their academic performance by the State Collaborative on Reforming Education. Uh, the Maryville City Schools recently received all A's on its state math, reading, social studies, science, and writing assessments. According to the Nashville Tennessean, they had the second highest test scores in the state in reading and math. The high school was selected as one of three finalists in the prize category of high schools for, quote, based primarily on student achievement gains and progress over time. More than 80% of Maryville High School students were proficient in math, 88% in reading language arts. More than 90% graduated in 2010 from the high school. Four seniors were national merit semifinalists. 48% of Maryville High School students who took the ACT college prep test last year met all four benchmarks for college and career readiness, English, math, reading, and science, compared to 15% statewide and 25% nationally. So the football team and the students academically have learned to work well together at Maryville High School. Now, how did this all happen? I know a little bit about this. I'm a proud graduate, as you might have suspected by now, of Maryville High School. And I've wondered about this for a long time. How could it have such success in so many things? It's not the richest town in the state by a long shot. Most families in Maryville would describe themselves as middle income. One indicator of why they succeed and why they achieve so much excellence in so many ways in their schools is that the town devotes about 70% of its budget to its schools. And it's in a county where about half the citizens, 50% of the citizens of 100,000 in Blunt County, have a library card. And it's a place where, at least it was when I was there, if you get in trouble at home, you get in trouble at, uh, if you get in trouble at school, you get in trouble at home. Uh, I can remember being called to the principal's office and administered a pretty stern discipline when I was in the eighth grade and I got the same treatment at home when I got home even though my father was chairman of the school board. So there was none of this business of parents blaming the teacher and the principal for what the child had done. But I think the school principal who's new to the town, Greg Roach, said it best. I saw him being interviewed at halftime of the football game last Saturday night. He was asked, how did this happen? How did you have this championship football team more than any other school in the state, and you're named the best school district in the state. How can you do that all at once? He said, well, it's a town school, and when something happens, everybody shows up. Well, they showed up at Tennessee Tech for the football game last Saturday night, but they also show up at the annual academic awards banquets. I've been to those in the last several years. It's more like a sporting contest with this student winning the National Spanish Championship and this one doing well in Latin and getting the same kind of honors and the same kind of awards and scholarships and pats on the back that the football players do. This emphasis on excellence in education and athletics is not something new in Maryville, Tennessee. My grandfather sold his farm in the county to move into town so my father could go to school and my aunt said that my father said that he felt like he'd died and gone to heaven when he had that opportunity. Then my father, who was an elementary school principal after World War II, ran for the city school board with four other men and women and they stayed on the board as a ticket. They were elected every year as a ticket. Um, 
And they stayed there for 25 years with a whole objective of improving the quality of the education in the Maryville City school systems. While all that was going on, my mother taught school, as I mentioned earlier, in a preschool program, really the only one in our county at the time. I think Mrs. Pesterfield also had a preschool program, but Mrs. Alexander's, and I used to call it lower institution of learning, had 25 three and four year olds and 25 five year olds in the afternoon. And she was lobbying the whole time to the school board, on which my father served, to put her out of business and start public kindergarten, which they eventually did in our state. I used to talk about the Maribel schools and the community of Maribel when I was running for president 20 years ago, and my friend Bill, ben friend Bill Bennett, who was also a United States Education Secretary and was chairman of my campaign, would say to me, Lamar, not every community in America is Maryville, Tennessee. And I know that. I know that. But I think a lot more could be. There are a lot of theories about what makes a good school, but I think Principal Roach may have it about right. It's a town school, and when something happens, everybody shows up. And I think our new Speaker of the House in Tennessee, Beth Harwell, had it right too. When she observed that our state legislature finished its work early, had some disagreements, but worked well together, got some results, and she said they had learned in kindergarten to work well together and that maybe that lesson would be a good lesson for Washington, D.C. Well, Speaker Harwell, I think, is right. And the example of the Maribel football team and the Maribel students, I think, is also right. When everybody shows up, when something's going on, and when people work well together, good things happen. Working well together, in our case, bipartisanship, is not a goal. Just as working well together was not the goal of the football team, they wanted the championship. It wasn't the goal of the students, they wanted the scholarship. But they knew that they had to work well together as a community to get a result. They got a championship football team, they got the best school district in the state. Perhaps that's a lesson for the United States Senate as we seek to take the very difficult responsibilities we have here and earn the respect of the men and women of this country who hired us and sent us here to solve problems. That's why today I would like to celebrate the success of the championship football team of Maryville High School and the championship school district of Maryville, Tennessee, and suggest that their lesson of working well together might be a good lesson for us. I thank the President and I yield the floor. Thank you for listening. Mr. President, I noticed the absence of a, I noticed the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
The Senate has been in a period of morning, morning business throughout much of the day. Earlier today, they blocked the nomination of um, for the District of Columbia Federal Court. The vote there was 54 to uh, 45. As they continue in this quorum call, we're going to show you the comments of Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid from earlier today talking about uh, work on the payroll tax cuts. It's just under 10 minutes. Republicans are doing their best to convince the American public that they support the payroll tax cut, that they're not in favor of raising taxes for middle class Americans, about 160 million of them. But what a strange way of proving that's how they feel. We saw what happened on the Senate floor last week. The proposal that they made didn't even get a majority of the Republicans. Yesterday, Republicans criticized our plan, our revised plan, and they hadn't even read it. If they'd taken time to read the legislation, uh, they would have seen that uh, basically every piece in there is bipartisan in nature, including now the tax on millionaires. So it, unless there's something changes quickly, it doesn't seem the Republicans are going to follow their leadership. Leader McConnell, Speaker Boehner both said they support extending the payroll tax cut. I repeat, funny way of showing it the way they've been legislating or non-legislating. We can't afford to let the extreme voices in the Republican Party force a thousand dollar a year tax increase for the middle class. Fortunately, there's a small group of Republicans we're beginning to speak out to do the right thing. Susan Collins, of course, we know what she's done. We had public statements made last week by Pat Roberts and Johan saying that it's about time, I'm paraphrasing this, that the people who are making a lot of money help solve some of the problems we have in the country. So I'm happy to see Democrats and Republicans at least talking the right way. I've been encouraged to see Republicans expressing more optimism about way to pay for these problems that we have. Um, I talked about Johans. He said, and I quote, "I sense a change in mood when it comes to asking millionaires to pay their fair share." For the sake of the middle class, I certainly hope the senator from Nebraska is right. Progress is being made. We've had a lot of staff work and a significant amount of member work on this with the, with the uh, chairman and ranking members. Um, we still have a ways to go. There were had 113 different writers, or I refer to them as earmarks, that um, we've eliminated quite a few of them and we'll continue to work on them. It's very important we get this bill done as soon as we can. We don't, do not want to have another continuing resolution, and Speaker Boehner has told me that's how he feels also. I hope so. I, I, I don't have any reason to say they won't. I'm confident they will. But, you know, you, you, let's talk about Cordray. I listened to my friend, uh, Republican leader talk about Cordray and the judges. I'm sure glad we, we're going to have a vote on this and words to that effect. Well, we're not having a vote on it. These are cloture votes so that we can have a vote. So I'm, I, uh, and, and always understand in the private sector or in the government, if somebody suggests a committee, you'll know that something's gone wrong. And that's what he has suggested. In effect, we don't want one person making all the decisions. We want a committee making those decisions, and that's uh, why the Republicans are wrong on that. I'm very disappointed that Halligan was not approved. We have been making some progress on the judges. We still have far too many that are still on the calendar. But we, I, I just think we have a different 
outlook on the D.C. Circuit Court. They want all Republicans there, and that's not fair. <laughs> Jobless benefits, we have to do that. It's really important. There are two things that will really hurt the economy if we don't do them, is extending the payroll tax cuts and extending the unemployment compensation. I, I believe strongly that we have to do something with SGR, the so-called doc fix. This is not something to give the doctors a big fat present. It's a, something we have to do. This was the reason we're in the hole we're in now. This was a budget gimmick that was done during the Bush years. We've got to get away from that. As Senator Kyle said, it's all monopoly money, and we should use the uh, overseas contingency fund to pay for that. I hope that's, in fact, what Senator Kyle and Bacchus work out. We, we are not going to leave Washington until we, until we pass the extenders and pass the um, extenders payroll tax cut. We have to do something with the um, payroll tax cut, unemployment compensation, omnibus, and I'm missing on one thing. Anyway, there's five things we have to do before we leave. Yes, we do. And you will not leave Washington. I don't intend to. No. When do you plan to bring up your latest proposal on the payroll tax cut extension for a floor vote? Uh, we'll probably have a vote on that Friday. I can't do anything on it until tomorrow because it doesn't ripen until that time. Hopefully the Republicans will come forward with some proposals. You know, they have been totally silent. As you learned probably earlier today, the House isn't going to even try to do anything this week. They've given up. So that's not a good sign. Thank you. And what? Balanced budget minute. We're going to have that before we go. That's not a must do. We're going to do it because that's what the law says. But I, it won't take much time. It'll be very short. Uh, Andre, I'm going to do it. Uh, I did it this morning. The Senate Majority Leader from uh, earlier today, the Senate continues in a quorum call much of the day. They've been in a period of morning business, general speeches after earlier today, blocking the nomination, a judicial nomination for the uh, District of Columbia Federal Circuit. The vote there was 54 to, uh, to 45. Meanwhile, Senate Republicans came out shortly after Harry Reid to speak to reporters about another nomination, that of Richard Cordray to head the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. More than 40 Senate Republicans oppose confirming anyone to head the bureau established in the financial regulatory overhaul uh, uh, law of last year. Their comments are about 10 minutes, and we'll show you as much as we can. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, what we thought we'd do here is uh, take a few moments and describe for you uh, our concerns about the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the reason that we do not believe anyone should be confirmed as director of the CFPB until some reform is enacted. And I'm going to call on our leader on the Banking Committee, Richard Shelby, to, 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 to walk you through the changes that really need to be made to prevent this from being a completely runaway, unaccountable agency, which is exactly the way it was crafted uh, to be. With that, Senator Shelby. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, all of you know I opposed the Dodd-Frank legislation. We tried to improve it as, as it went along. And what we have proposed, though, 45 of us to the president uh, dealing with Dodd-Frank and ultimately with his agency, is said we have, we have three things we would like to bring up because we want accountability for this agency, which has none today uh, as it's structured. One, we think it ought to be subject to a council, not just one person with all the power in the world uh, there accountable to no one. Secondly, we believe that it needs to be subject to the appropriations process because the Congress should have, have oversight of it and it ought to be accountability to the American people through the Congress. And thirdly, we want to make sure that this agency, as it's considering rules, will uh, take into account uh, the, the safety and soundness of our financial institutions and things like this. We have not heard from the President on this. Uh, uh, 
the nominee, uh, as, as far as I know, I have met with him. Seems like a nice man and so forth. But this is not about him. It's about the structure of this, a, a powerful, I think, a monster as far as uh, future regulation to overregulate our economy, create more regulations and fewer jobs. That's why I oppose this nomination, and I believe that uh, the overwhelming majority of the caucus will too. Okay, let, let me, uh, Richard, let, let's get, we, we'll get back to questions in just a minute. Uh, I've also asked a number of our colleagues who were identified in the newspaper as being targets of the President's lobbying effort on behalf of this nominee to join us and be happy to, at this point to have any of them uh, make their own comments about this uh, particular uh, nominee and the issues that we've just described. You want to. Yeah, this is really uh, the way this whole thing has evolved has been uh, highly disappointing. Even when the Treasury themselves brought forth the proposal to deal with a consumer agency, they themselves thought there should be a board. One of the reasons this agency cannot move ahead is that rulemaking is vested solely in one individual. It's unprecedented and we've just asked for a few common sense check and balances to be put in place I think all Tennesseans most Tennesseans would agree that for an agency like this that has such powers powers to create rules that state AGs can sue companies against not against legislation but against rules that they create. It, it really is unprecedented. I've actually talked with the White House on a couple of occasions to say, why would you not let this organization be institutionalized and to be part of our government going forward and be set up in an appropriate way? Why would you not think that was a bigger win than this political argument that's playing out right now with an agency that all of the rules can be undone again by just one person who's different who comes after so I'm very disappointed especially in the Treasury Department for not at least trying to broker a good government solution to this and uh, certainly nothing the president has said nor anyone else has changed my mind that putting this in place as it is now is an incredible irresponsible act by Congress Hoosiers want jobs. Uh, Hoosiers want lack of regulation. And they, they see at least the enterprise in America that might bring us jobs hindered by overregulation. I stand with my colleagues on this issue because clearly this is a case of tremendous overregulation without any control by the Congress. And even after we have expressed this to the President, to the administration, for Weeks and months, there has been no response except to send forward another nominee. And so I stand with my colleagues in voting against cloture so that we will not have a nominee until we have proper accountability. I actually voted for the Dodd-Frank bill, but I am completely opposed to appointing a nominee to head this bureau until we correct the very serious structural flaws that are in the bill. To me, it is inconceivable that in this time of tight budgets that we would create a new agency that is completely unaccountable in terms of its budget. Under the Dodd-Frank bill, this agency's budget can be as high as $500 million. It's actually up to the head of the agency to decide what his or her budget should be. This has nothing to do with Mr. Cordray. He's clearly a qualified individual with a good reputation. It has everything to do with accountability for how money is spent in government. And it makes no sense for a structure to be created, no matter how noble the cause may be, where there is simply no accountability, 
no oversight for the budget. This is not about the nominee who appears to be a decent person and may very well be qualified. Can you imagine if the Republicans passed something like this and tried to put a partisan person, uh, as was originally decided, into this kind of power with no accountability, no, no real transparency, in an agency that could, be, could suck it to the taxpayers $500 million and never have to really explain why? I mean, my gosh, this is unbelievable that anybody even has any questions about it. Like I say, it's not about the nominee. It's about a process that's running out of control, and frankly, by Democrats who really haven't thought this through. Okay. Yeah. Senator Corker said he'd spoken to the White House about it. You say there's been no move whatsoever. Have you talked to the White House about this or not? I'm not getting the same signal. Well, normally, if you would send a, a letter down like this, you'd hear something back. Uh, I've not heard a word. I didn't feel it was incumbent on me to continue to lobby them. We made it very clear what we thought needed to be done, as Senator Shelby and others have outlined, to make this a, a runaway agency accountable, uh, like every other agency we've been able to find in the uh, federal structure. So, I know I didn't feel it was incumbent on me to call them. I thought maybe they might call me. Unveiled a proposal to extend the payroll tax cut with the surtax on income over $3 million. What are your thoughts on that? With the car value. With the car value. With the car value. Yes, she might want to say Senator McConnell, could we get your opinion on the bill? Is it something you could support? Well, what, what, we're, <clears throat> what we have said, most of us, is that. I, well, I, let me just speak for myself, because there are, as you know from last week, there are differences of opinion in my conference about this. <laughs> so I'll speak for myself. I, I am not in favor of raising taxes on working people. I do favor extending the payroll tax holiday for another year uh, in conjunction with job-creating proposals, which we expect to be included in a final version of this that will come over from the House of Representatives so that it provides both some relief on the job producing side as well as tax relief and if it's coupled with unemployment insurance, something for those who are currently uh, unemployed. Uh, I think most, America, uh, most Republicans are very reluctant to raise taxes on anyone uh, during this economic uh, crisis that we find ourselves in, but there may be others uh, who have a different point of view and if uh, any of those people would like to comment to you, obviously they can feel free to do that. We, we would like to see provisions in the final package that actually create jobs, and in particular create jobs right now. And the reason there's been a lot of discussion about the Keystone XL pipeline is because if there's any shovel-ready project in America, this is it. Any project that would put people to work right now, this is it. Uh, any project that wouldn't cost the government a dime, this is it. Uh, I think that's pretty appealing on a bipartisan basis to a lot of people. That's an example of the kinds of things that might be included in a final package that we expect to get over from the House of Representatives. I'm going to take one more. Now. Yeah, I've, I've uh, had a standing rule not to comment on the uh, Republican uh, campaign for president. It's quite interesting. We're all watching it and looking forward to having a nominee. Thank you. The Senate Republican leader from earlier today, Majority Leader Harry Reid today, moved to a limit debate on the president's pick to head the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Richard Cordray, former Ohio Attorney General, the, uh, later, the week, later in the week the Senate is expected to uh, reject the motion that will re require 60 votes. They also failed to move forward today on the um, nomination of Caitlin Halligan to be a, a, a judge on the District of Columbia Federal Circuit. That fell short of the 60 votes needed. That was a vote of 50, 54 to uh, 45. And throughout much of the day, the Senate's been a period of uh, general speeches. Over in the House, meanwhile, they have begun debate on, the, uh, on a bill that would require congressional approval of federal regulation 
with an annual economic cost of $100 million or more. They'll finish up work on that bill tomorrow. The House is still in session. You can follow that on C-SPAN. Thank you. 
Thank you.